Good evening, everybody. Um, on behalf of Nevada Humanities, uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you this evening. My name is Stephanie Gibson. Uh, I'm the Assistant Director with Nevada Humanities. And for those who don't know us, uh, we're your state's affiliate for the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, we connect and transform communities by sharing and amplifying the stories, ideas, experiences, and traditions of the diverse people of this state. Uh, we are committed to this mission, even in these very unsocial times, and we are really committed to staying connected uh, today. Um, you're part of this virtual Nevada Humanities Salon program tonight. Um, it was launched six years, in a, six years ago in Reno, and it's a keystone program for us, filling a great desire in our community for fellowship, learning, and conversation. So we normally host this at Sundance Books and Music, our forever partners in Nevada, um, and it feels completely wrong still <laughs> to not be with them tonight, but they are with us in spirit. And, you know, I encourage you to buy um, all your books at your local bookstore, including Sundance. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge another thing as well, um, where we are today, where I currently sit myself, um, even though um, my colleagues with me tonight are, are virtual. Um, we want to acknowledge that we gather on the traditional land of the Paiute, the Shoshone, and the Washoe people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit as well. And I hope we can start to do this together tonight. Um, so I'd also love a show of hands or thumbs up or a comment if this is your first Nevada Humanities event. Um, we normally have really good wine and cheese, so if you have like a wheel of brie on hand, please, um, you know, bring it, <laughs> bring it to this event with you. And if you're not on our contact list and you'd like to be and you'd like to receive our invites and e-blasts, please sign up at nevadahumanities.org. Um, programs like these are not possible without the coordination and support of many, uh, many people and organizations, um, including yourself. And we have support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, the Maryland Mountain Endowment for the Humanities, uh, the Community Foundation of, of Western Nevada. And tonight, it's part of the Democracy and the Informed Citizen Initiative, um, administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils. This initiative seeks to deepen the public's knowledge and appreciation of the vital connections between democracy, the humanities, journal journalism, and the informed, citi informed citizenry. And we thank the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for their generous support of this and the Pulitzer Prizes for their partnership. So how will this event unfold? I'm gonna introduce our wonderful speakers and then I'm gonna duck away here. Um, but if you have questions, please uh, fill them in um, in the chat bar below and um, you, our panelists will be able to answer them. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator, St uh, Stacy Montooth. She's a citizen of the Walker River Paiute Nation and the executive director of the State of Nevada Indian Commission appointed by Governor Steve Sisolak in 2019. A member of his cabinet, Stacy is the liaison from Governor Sisolak to 27 Nevada tribes, bands, and colonies. A graduate of the University of Missouri School of Journalism, Stacy has spent over a decade in service to Nevada tribes. From 2012 to 2019, she worked at the Reno Sparks Indian Colony as that tribe's first public relations community information officer. Welcome, Stacy. Um, Autumn Harry is a member of the Paiute Lake Paiute of uh, Pyramid Lake Paiute Tribe in Northern Nevada. Autumn is currently a master's student at the University of Nevada Reno, studying geography with an emphasis on indigenous mapping methods and restoration of indigenous place names. Autumn is a fisherwoman, land defender, and indigenous rights activist who continues to work within indigenous communities, learning about how climate change affects cultural and natural resources. Recently, Autumn has been involved in organizing actions such as the Reno Women's March, bringing awareness to missing and murdered Indigenous women, and the importance of preserving water in Nevada. Welcome, Autumn. Sanavi Spoonhunter is a reporter and filmmaker from the Paiute Arapaho Lakota Nations. Spoonhunter is an enrolled member of the Arapaho tribe of the Wind River Reservation, but was raised in the Owens Valley of Central California. She's currently a Master's of Journalism Documentary Film Candidate at the University of California, Berkeley. While studying at Haskell Indian Nations University in 2012, she realized that Native perspectives and stories are significantly underreported, and this began, began her interest in covering Indian country. She transferred to the University of Nevada, Reno's Reynolds School of Journalism, with an emphasis in print reporting. Following her inherent path 
passion to pursue the current landscape of Native issues, but in a captivating way, she was led to documentary filmmaking. Her thesis film that highlights the Crow tribe of Montana in the southern, southern eastern region of the state is scheduled for completion in 2020. And last but not least, Derek Work, uh, a uh, An Annie <laughs> and Nakoda of Fort Belknap Indian Community in Montana um, is a student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, studying multimedia journalism. Inspired by the lack of mainstream media coverage of the Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, Work decided to pursue a degree in media. His work focuses on positively and accurately covering the issues of Indigenous people within Indian country. Jarek currently works as a communication lead for the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute, providing a platform to amplify the voices of Indigenous youth. I'm so grateful that you're all here with us today, and I look forward to this conversation. Thank you all. I'll leave it to Stacy. Good day. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. It is such an honor to be a part of this amazing salon. I have the privilege of knowing each of the three individual participants personally. It's because of young people like the three that I get to talk with today that I know that our world is in good hands. So we're going to start off with uh, the same question for all three panelists, but we're going to start with Autumn. So Autumn, would you talk a little bit about the work you're doing and what it was that drove you to that work? So, Hamu, no Autumn Harry Minani, no Kuyui Papanananaway, no Kuyui Takata Taneno. Hello, everyone. My name is Autumn Harry, and I'm from the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. I'm both Paiute and Navajo, and I'm in my second year at the University of Nevada Reno um, geography program. So I'm working on my master's with an emphasis on indigenous place names. And yeah, it's been a topic that I've become really passionate about. Um, back in 2018, I was with the group. Uh, my friend Jolie Varela actually founded a group called Indigenous Women Hike. And so in 2018, we hiked what we call the Nimapoyo, which in Paiute is the People's Road or the People's Trail. Um, but it's what you know, most people know as the, the John Muir Trail. And so that journey was actually 190 miles and we spent 22 days on the trail. Um, and so that really, you know, while we were on the trail, there were a lot of names that were, that were present on our maps and, you know, that were, um, they're, they're English based and they, you know, some of those names were very derogatory and didn't represent our Numa people and especially the other nations that call those mountains their, their homelands. And so once we finished that hike, um, I sort of jumped into graduate school and I started thinking about place names back home and how, you know, here at Pyramid Lake, we don't really, um, you know, we don't really have a, a thorough documentation of our our places and, you know, especially our mountains and different areas. Um, so when I look at maps, it's all English based. And a lot of these places, you know, within our homelands aren't weren't named by us. So I started thinking about how I could do research on this topic. And yeah, it, it's been going well so far, um, but, you know, it really got me thinking about how people name places and sort of how um, settlers, especially when they first started coming west, um, they started giving names to places, and that was a form of domination, and, you know, that was a form of, of um, sort of representing their power and asserting their power on the land and over the, the original people. And even here at Pyramid Lake, you know, I, I say Pyramid Lake, but we know it as Kuiwi Pa Pununata, which is the Kuiwi standing water. And that's named after our sucker fish species. And so, yeah, it really got me thinking about maps and who creates maps and who gains power by creating maps. Um, but when we think about modern day mapping platforms, 
you know, such as Google, which is what, uh, um, you know, what most people use, um, you're not seeing our people represented within those maps. You're not seeing our territories. You're not hearing our stories. You're not seeing our languages at all. And so I'm trying to see how I can sort of bring that back because as we start doing more research within our indigenous place names, um, it's a form of revitalization and it's also a form of reclamation. So something that I want to work towards is documenting some of our names. Um, some of them are, are known, but they just haven't been, you know, made public or they haven't been made available to our communities. But eventually I would love to see more of our people going out to these places and, and speaking our languages and using those original names. Thank you, Autumn. It's so thoughtful what you're doing. And I would be really interested if we could just stop 10 people on Virginia Street and do a quick survey and see if anybody has ever put thought into why the Trekkie is called the Trekkie. Mm -hmm. And I know you know that. <laughs> and hopefully we'll get to address that. Yes. So let's move a, along and um, again, pose the same question to, to Sanevi. Tell us about your work, Sanevi, and tell us what drove you to it. My name is Sanevi Spoon Hunter. I am Northern Arapaho, Northern Paiute, just like Stephanie had mentioned, and a little bit of Lakota. And I guess from where I went to school, where I gained most of my education, especially um, during like my up, like my pursuit for an undergraduate degree, um, being in the school system, you know, in high school and in eighth grade, a lot of times we're not even taught our histories. And so it wasn't until about 2012 when I went to Haskell Indian Nations University where I learned a tremendous amount just about the history of like a lot that has happened to our people, especially in terms of boarding schools and historical trauma. And it was just like, I was completely mind blown because I had never been introduced to any of this kind of information before. And so I had no idea in which direction I wanted to go into, but um, I took a journalism course and during that class, we watched a film, it's called Real Engine. It's from a Canadian filmmaker named Neil Diamond. And it kind of explores the idea of stereotyping in media and stereotyping in film especially. And how a lot of times Native people are portrayed in like, just like very generalized and very um, derogatory kind of imagery and things like of that nature. And it's just not a reflection of the current landscape that make up the 574 tribes across the United States. And those are just the ones that are federally recognized. And so I kind of wanted to go into this field of journalism to educate not only the general public of these issues, but also our own people. Because I did realize during you know, my high school years and all of that stuff was that, like, I wasn't even aware of a lot of the information. Um, and so that's kind of where I began. But in terms of uh, legacy media, um, in terms of your you know, um, quick turnaround news organizations, they don't give thorough justice in terms of like these type of topics and they don't give a lot of um, time to put into digging deeper in these issues and why our communities face a lot of really, you know, difficult, um, yeah, just difficult <laughs> issues within our communities. And so um, it stems from, you know, a lot of it stems from jurisdictional issues and just um, treaty rights and things like that. And so that's, that's kind of like what led me into documentary film is that I, I would have a space to explore those ideas a little bit more and give justice to our communities overall. Thank you, Snavi. Very interesting. I um, really perked up when you mentioned Haskell's Indian Nations. Um, I've heard other folks in this area who are some of the um, most high profile native leaders mentioned 
that they had a similar experience that after growing up in the Great Basin, they really were empowered by going way out to the middle of the Midwest into this little Kansas town. So I appreciate that story. Let's move on and talk a little bit with Jarrett. Jarrett, the same question to you. Tell us about the work that you're doing and what is it that drove you to it? Okay. Wahei niti, nina haban, nani sit, Jarrett Work on Hitan. Hello, everybody. My name is Jarrett Work. I am Aani and Nakota from Fort Belknap, Montana, Indian community here in beautiful Montana. I'm actually back home. I came home when um, COVID started getting scary. I am a journalism student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. I transferred there a little uh, last year. I was at UNR. Uh, I lived there for three years, and that's how I met all three of you amazing women. Um, and my main scope of work uh, has been just about representation of Indigenous peoples. Um, that's within the media, within imagery, and also uh, youth empowerment. Uh, growing up, we moved around a lot. Uh, my mom was a travel nurse, and my dad was a construction worker, so we moved around so much that we, I went to probably like 20 different schools growing up. So that's about how much we moved around. And every time we moved somewhere different, I got treated differently. Uh, a lot of the time we would be, you know, on reservation schools or we would be off the reservation schools. And whenever I was back home, you know, on the reservation with, you know, other indigenous youth, you know, I was always welcomed into the community and everything like that. But when I went to uh, schools off of the reservation, um, I was treated very differently. I remember one specific moment um, when I was in the fourth grade, my teacher singled me out because I didn't finish one, one assignment. He, and he was like, Jarrett, why didn't you finish this assignment? And I was like, I don't know. I was super shy back then, so I didn't really talk. And he's like, I'll tell you why you didn't finish that assignment. You didn't finish it because you're a worthless Indian. You're never gonna amount to anything. You're just gonna be a drunk and an alcoholic and you're never gonna leave the reservation. And that's, from that moment on, I've always wanted to prove some, like, everybody wrong about their stereotypical um, ideas of Indigenous people. You know, we're not just drunks, we're not alcoholics, you know, we're not drug addicts. You know, we are amazing people that value community, that value our elders, that value our youth, that value, you know, so many great things that, you know, that sparked something in me when I was, like, in fourth grade, you know, to prove him wrong but also to prove myself that, you know, what he thinks of me is not true. So, you know, fast forward all the way up in, to uh, college, my parents really wanted me to pursue medicine, but I didn't really like it. I always liked writing and photography. So I took a journalism class as an elective my se first semester at UNR, and then I fell in love. Um, and and I decided, you know, right then after that semester to pursue journalism, you know, change my major and everything like that. And then the Dakota Access Pipeline happened. Um, and I saw a major lack of representation and coverage for mainstream media outlets. And one time I actually brought it up in class and, you know, my journalism professors, they weren't even aware about it. So then, you know, a couple of weeks later, everybody was talking about it when they released the attack dogs onto the protectors and everything like that. So I've always wanted to, well, that really sparked my, well, I don't know what I'm trying to say. That really <laughs> inspired me to pursue media. And um, it was actually how I met Autumn. I was doing an article for class one day and she had just gotten back from, uh, from uh, North Dakota and <laughs> I did an interview with her. And then um, after that, I applied to the Native American Journalism uh, a Fellowship. And I've been a member with them since 2017. And that's how I met Senevi. Uh, and being a part of Naja, it gives me this opportunity to learn from the best of the best, you know, within Indian country and gain their mentorship and everything like that. Um, yeah. I think that 
gets me up to where I am. Oh, now I currently work for the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute. I love my job. I am the communications, um, consult, uh, communications lead and I've been with them since January and it gives me an opportunity to work with amazing youth from across the country and give them a platform to elevate their voice. Thank you, Derek. That was a great answer. It's very interesting. Um, you have a, a very unique path um, from Southern Montana. And um, I'd love to know what the address of that fourth grade teacher is. I'm a pacifist. Um, so ladies, um, I'm gonna jump back to Autumn. Let's talk a little bit more about um, the geographic uh, mapping. We'll talk more about um, this idea that through using the indigenous names that that action alone can help native people reclaim and, and be recognized. Autumn, can you give us some specific examples of some of the, um, give us some specific examples of some of the new names, the true names, and how you believe those are helping all the indigenous people in the Great Basin? Sure, so, um, yeah, I think, you know, what, what we had been talking about earlier, and, and Stacey, what you said, if you were to ask people, you know, who live in Reno, uh, and if you were to take a survey, not many people know, or, or sometimes don't even care, you know, about the land that they're standing on, and who those original peoples are. And, you know, it, it's very apparent when we are in Reno, um, even on the university, it's, you know, our, our populations are so small and because our peoples have been, um, you know, relocated and placed on reservations, geographically we're isolated from the cities, right? We're isolated from these urban areas. And so we're not seen as having any connection to that land at all. Um, and same with the areas outside our reservation, you know, as uh, I could speak, you know, as a Northern Paiute, um, you know, our, our Numu people, we had this huge expansive territory, um, same with the Washoe, same with the, the Shoshones. And, you know, it's, it's not even really acknowledged anymore, um, but we still have connections to those places. And so with the place names, um, you know, it, it's so important to know those names and to, to really document them because if you don't, you know, those names could be lost forever. We have elders that are increasing in age and they have all of this wonderful knowledge. Um, and, you know, if you don't document them, then, then we could lose all access to that. So for, for Pyramid Lake, um, you know, our Kuyui Pot Puninata, that name, you know, it really allows um, our people to reconnect to to that lake um, because our Kiwi are part of our identity as Numu people and we've relied on this fish you know for thousands of years and these fish have always taken care of us and so we have to use that name as a reminder of our responsibility to the land and to our people and to the language as well. Um, another example um, is you know, when we hiked the Numapoyo, we talked to so many individuals on that trail and, you know, they would come up to us and we were like a group of seven native women, right? And um, I think even us being there, it was sort of not really expected. Um, and so people would notice us on the trail and they would come up to us and be like, hey, are you guys hiking the JMT or are you hiking the, the John Muir Trail? And we'd be like, no, we're hiking the Numapoyo. And we would take the time to talk to every single one of those individuals and educate them and tell them that these trails and our people have existed long before, you know, explorers like John Muir 
had ever stepped foot in those areas and remind them of the the violent history that sort of stemmed from from those encounters with with John Muir and other explorers who forcibly removed native communities from from these really pristine beautiful areas such as Awani which is also Yosemite um, you know for for these national parks to be created and so we would have that conversation um, and once we you know after the the 22 day journey we step foot on Tumungaya, which is also known as Mount Whitney, right? Um, and so that's the Shoshone word for, for Mount Whitney is Tumungaya, which means very old man. And so these stories, you know, these, these place names have stories attached to them and they have people attached to them as well. And so the place names are just so important. Uh, they need to be protected because they, they hold that history and they hold, you know, the, co the connection that our people have with those places. And so it's a lot of work and I'm sure I'm not able to document all of them, but I'm trying to at least go back and sort of see how our people pass that, those names down generationally and also through their families. Thank you, Autumn. That is extraordinarily interesting to me. I am really curious when you talked about taking that hike, the indigenous women hike, when you did come across those people who clearly you stood out to and you took the time to educate them about where you were and why you were doing that, did you ever get pushback? What was, what was the general response? Yeah, the, the general response is, you know, people were some, I would say a majority of people um, wanted to listen, but there were those individuals who didn't really care, or there was one older gentleman who we had a conversation with, and we're very friendly people, right? We, we, we talk to people um, with love, and we were having this conversation with this, this older man, and he just yeah, he said something really disturbing to us. And it was like, oh, well, he was talking about I Ishi. And he's like, oh, well, Ishi was the last native within the Sierra, in the Sierra Nevada. And we're like, no, that's not true. Like, we're right here in front of you, you know, and our people are still here within these mountains. And so we're trying to work out on ways on, on making those areas accessible, because I think, you know, although those these national parks are within our territories, our ancestral territories, there's still barriers to access for our native people. And our native people don't always want to go through a checkpoint to go into a national park or have to pay fees to visit their ancestral sites and, and sites of prayer. Um, so there's definitely still barriers of access that we're trying to break down. Thank you, Autumn. So, Senevi, I had mentioned earlier, uh, you talked about your experience at Haskell. And um, again, I've had the privilege of knowing you for a while, and I've gotten to know some of your family members. In retrospect, um, and maybe this is something that you all um, have had some thoughts on, how, where, Where's the gap? Is it within our native communities for not teaching our young people in it simultaneously as they have public schools? Or is it a constitutional responsibility that the federal government had promised, they have the trust responsibility, and it is them falling down on the job by not ensuring that not just Native Americans, but all students in public schools know the accurate history of the first peoples of this land. Oh, I'm sorry, my internet's cutting out a little bit, so it might get a little bit spotty here. Um, but that's a really good question. It's very like thought provoking. Um, 
especially in terms of like this past year and what I've been learning with my uh, thesis work. Um, I think that what it comes down to a lot of times is in policy because, um, you know, growing up where we have these certain requirements going to a certain educational institution that's in guidelines with um, the federal government guidelines and as Native people and, you know, not all tribes are treaty tribes, but under certain tribes that are around like, well, I think a little bit over 400 tribes, they have treaty responsibilities with these with the federal government and the federal government, they have certain clauses in those treaties that, you know, give building for, you know, like give clauses to provide these communities with certain things because they took away so much land. Like I think um, Autumn was talking about when she was describing a little bit about, you know, our ancestral homelands, like a lot of it was just like, the, like the, the tribe that I'm currently um, researching is the Crow in Montana, and they just had a vast amount of land. It was through the Dakotas, through Montana, Wyoming, and even a little bit into Canada. And that encompassed over 100 million acres. And today it stands at 2.2 million. And so just that, that shrinkage of their land base, their homeland, has, you know, like these treaties, they, they do need to be upheld. Um, and just, so I do think it comes in the form of policy. Um, however, I do think it's, you know, I think it's a good, uh, I think it's a good kind of way for tribal governance, governments across the United States to kind of evaluate too. Like, I think a lot of Head Starts are implementing like, you know, their own cultural history within their tribe and how they can, you know, pass that knowledge down to the little ones when they're young to kind of instill that like pride of being who they are and knowing their history. And I think that that's really important. And so I think that, the, you know, there's, there's different ways to navigate how you can do that. But I think in terms of, um, Hopefully, I don't know, this is like all th purely theoretical, but just like my thoughts on, on this would be, you know, like the tribal government working with like in their capacity with like young children and instilling that type of pride through their history and the knowledge. But then also you have to hold the government accountable in textbooks and, you know, all of these things that are within that state. And I think states are doing that. They, I think there's um, there's a good program, I think, in Nevada, actually, where they have implemented um, a little bit of that tribal history for um, school curriculum, which I think is, um, is a really good first step. I, I appreciate your qualifier that it's the first step. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your thesis and um, how do you see that impacting what you do once you earn that master's degree? <clears throat> yeah, so like a lot of it has to deal with um, Autumn's work, right? Like her thesis work too on um, just kind of just like going into com like her community and documenting areas that are, you know, their traditional place names and even like that type of mapping. Because when you ignore these communities, like the, for instance, the tribe that I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm making a documentary film about, it's about 20 minutes, but it's essentially about a food desert. And these tribes, which is 60% of tribes across the nation, the, you know, the federally recognized tribes. So it's about a little over 300 um, tribes across this nation struggle or live in a food desert because they're reliant on, you know, three types of government issued food systems. And then they're also reliant on nonprofit food deliveries. Um, and, uh, and this my film, my thesis film, it kind of explores this idea of food sovereignty, which a lot of communities across the country are kind of trying to, like it's, you know, gaining some traction and speed within, the, within our communities. And I think that's really important because it's the right to access and to identify your own food systems. And so this is an idea that the Crow tribe in a way is, it is exploring for hunting, for their hunting rights. And so when you have, colonial mapping practices, um, such as the ones that Autumn has to navigate right now in order to implement her, like, you know, traditionally what that looks like, it's just drastically different, right? Um, and so with this tribe, in terms of, like I said, the hunting sites, their traditional hunting grounds is in the Bighorn National Forest. And that spills from Montana into the state of Wyoming. And, and this is where I think it's interesting where it comes in 
like you knowing your history and you knowing your rights as a tribal person from your tribe because this case followed, there's a court case because one hunter who was a game warden of his tribe, I think he got his bachelor's at the state of Montana, but he knows his history, he knows his rights. He worked with the tribe in terms of like hunting and all these things. So he, and he went into the state of Wyoming, shot bull elk, brought it back to his community because he didn't want to get on food stamps. He didn't want to get on government assistance and he wanted to feed his, his, three daughter, his three daughters. And so the state of Wyoming cited him. And so there's this big old legal battle that happened anyway. It went up to the Supreme Court and he won, which is like huge for treaty tribes, right? Like you can actually, like these treaties that were written back in the 1800s can still be upheld and should be upheld. And I think that that's, and he knew that. And it's somebody like like that. I, I feel like he's he's very heroic in that sense, right? Like he was just, I don't, it's just really interesting how he knew he, re, he had the rights. He knew he had the courage to do it. And then he had the courage to stand his ground and really believe in, you know, his tribe's treaty rights. And like, you know, he was, he was like, I was right. You know, I didn't do anything wrong that day. And I think that that's really important when you kind of, when you learn about your history and you learn about all of these complexities within jurisdictional issues and all of like your rights as a native person, not just as a US citizen, but as, as a native person, it's just really empowering. And I think that um, it, it just, it's just a phenomenal example. And I think of, of one tribal member really, you know, believing in those, those things and knowing those things. So it's a fascinating story. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, so anyway, um, yeah. It sounds like a fascinating story and I look forward to your documentary because I'm sure you outline it perfectly. Let's talk a little bit with Jared about the flip side. So Jared, you've just heard from your two contemporaries about the work they're doing. Um, let's put your journalism lens on. After your experience at Standing Rock, and knowing about the work that Autumn's doing and the work that Sanavi's doing and some of those um, issues, what do you see in 2020? What's, talk about the challenges of an indigenous or Native American journalist. And if you would, if, if you're inclined, go ahead and let's talk about your approach. Um, could you sell? If, if to use my term, how would you pitch to your editor uh, a story about um, indigenous names mapping, or how would you how would you convince your editor that um, you know the documentary that Sanavi is working on deserves space in the major daily that you're working for? Yeah, it's a great question. So something similar that I, I did a couple of years ago. In 2018, I was a Generation Indigenous Movement Builders Fellow. And we were uh, a group of five in Native youth from across the country. And we were brought together to, you know, create, create movement, create a a project that we thought is very important. And um, we ended up creating the Reclaiming Our Narrative project, which uh, is a multimedia project that highlights influential Native youth from across the country and uses the platform from Center for Native American Youth and Generation Indigenous and uses that to amplify um, youth from across the country and the work that they're doing. Um, we actually highlighted Autumn uh, she was one of the people that I interviewed and shared her story about the Numu Payo um, re reclaiming the name, basically, right? Her her Indigenous women's hike um, movement, and we pitched it to a couple of different places. Just you know, telling that this is important. This is us reclaiming our narrative. This is us, you know taking it and using it and 
looking through an indigenous lens. It's us telling our own stories, you know, to not only native people, but to other people that showing that, that you know, because if you look at history, everything from like photography to like other stories has always been told, you know, primar primarily through, you know, a white male. So we thought that that project was super important and encompassing other things that could be just super important just to show that the work that's being done in Indian country is super, super important, super great, super fun, super just like important. And it's work that, you know, we do, we don't do it necessarily for like the recognition, we do it because it's important to us and it's important to our people. And that's the work that we do. Thank you, Jared. That's very interesting. I, um, I myself, um, Stephanie mentioned, am a degree journalist, and I remember um, back in 1989 when I was going to school, we talked about being uh, about the the definition of being objective, and um, one of the best professors I had talked about how the acknowledgement that you cannot be objective helps with your objectivity. I know that sounds convoluted, but um, I truly believe that's the case. So to help with the, the flow of our conversation, if you're not talked out, Jared, let's talk a little bit about um, the coverage currently. Everybody is talking about it. Everybody's feeling it. We're in the midst of this global global pandemic with COVID. So, and with your experience at Standing Rock, can you compare and contrast, how do you feel about the current coverage regarding the protests that are taking place right now? Mainstream media is covering folks that are out and about not conforming to social distancing uh, standards, and these are the, the people who believe that their uh, First Amendment rights are being trampled because they can't get a haircut or they can't go have a massage. So again, if you would, tell us from a native journalist perspective, how is the national media doing? Yeah, so I actually, I, I didn't go to Standing Rock. Um, so I reported from the from behind the scenes, <laughs> but I think that indigenous communities deserve to be in the mainstream media, not only just during like a pandemic or something you know as worldly changing as like the Dakota Access Pipeline was. Um, you know, we have multiple news organizations, indigenous news organizations like Indian Country Today that have been doing this work for years and years and years of highlighting what's going on within indigenous communities and just seeing all of their work and the indigenous reporters working for that news outlet, they have a different perspective and a different lens of how to cover Indian country, you know, because they're, it's their communities, it's, you know, it's their people, it's what's going on in their homes. So they know how to cover it differently and I've been seeing lately, like, President Nez of the Navajo Nation, he's been on CNN, CNN and interviews with, you know, these great big, huge news organizations like that. And I think that the work that Indian Country Today is doing, you know, will eventually get that big. Because when, once Mark Trehant took over a couple of years ago, they've grown monumentally, you know, they have hundreds of over a hundred thousand followers on Twitter, and that's you know, people from across the country, um, indigenous and non-indigenous, reading these indigenous stories about you know what's going on in Indian country. And I kind of my internet cut out a little bit while you were talking, so I only heard partial of your question. I hope I answered as best as what I could hear. <laughs> I'm sorry about in the middle of nowhere. So my internet is not that great. 
I appreciated your answer, Jarrett. Maybe you can just um, give us one more bit of insight. Tell me, I'd like you to give a letter grade to the national media based on their current COVID coverage. And when I say national media, I mean the three major networks, the um, you know the 24-hour news networks, as well as the major dailies. Can you give them a grade, A to F? What say you? Uh, there's always room for improvement, right? <laughs> um, honestly, exactly. There's room for improvement. So I'm happy to see it being covered. I feel bad grading. I didn't like grading when I was a tutor, <laughs> but I would have to say, I don't know. I'm bad at grading. It, it needs work. It can be improved. I guess that's what we could say. Okay. I apologize for putting you on the spot. Um, but I, I know that um, you're, you're, contemporary and my former intern, Sanevi, will have a letter grade. How would you, um, what, what would you assign to uh, CNN and Fox and the New York Times right now, Sanevi? So I was, um, I've been like so engrossed in my <laughs> film at this point, like all media coverage is kind of been like not on my radar. Um, I, I do feel like it has improved in terms of giving people more coverage of native tribal issues. Um, I think that's improved in a certain aspect, which I would bring that to a B. It could do better, but at least we're on the radar in some form uh, nationally. However, um, in terms of content that's been kind of channeling out of these news organizations, I would have to say D. It's like the, I've, I've watched one news clip of you know the Northern Arapaho tribe. It was terrible. It was just like, the term poverty porn, I don't know how, <laughs> but it was pure, purely that. They just talked about housing and how inadequate housing was and just very distasteful. So I know we have to be cognizant of time here, but um, in our last conversation with you, Seneva, you mentioned food sovereignty um, associated with um, your work right now. Tell us if you can very succinctly, what would food sovereignty mean right now to not just the Great Basin 27 tribal nations, but all tribal nations, if they did in fact have food sovereignty? It, I think it would look like um, just being having your right to access these traditional spaces where you normally gathered and hunted and were able to operate that space and continue to have access to it. I think that that's what that would look like, but from that, my perspective. I appreciate that. Okay, Miss Autumn, do you want to give them um, the national news media a grade A, B, C, D, or F? D, or delayed. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in school, that meant poor, but okay, <laughs> deep or delayed. Yeah, no, I felt that the the coverage, you know, I think a lot of indigenous peoples have been following what's been happening on the Navajo Nation, and it took so long for national news organizations to finally address it, and I'm glad that they did, um, because, you know, they're able to set up um, you know, with more viewership and with more people who are becoming aware, they're able to get more donations to help the Navajo Nation and to help the people get the supplies and the, and the food that they need, um, which is really important. So D for delayed right now is my grade. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. And, you know, because we've been talking about how important it is to know history, um, I want to remind mind all of you, but I bet you remember this because um, of your important work. It was, in fact, an international journalist who posed the first direct question to then President Obama about the Dakota Access Line that really got the conversation, really 
I guess, got the mainstream media on board. So finally, um, Autumn, you had talked um, about the reclamation, about the recognition of indigenous, of indigenous um, names. Talk a little bit um, about how that is connected currently. We have this situation with this global pandemic, with COVID. Talk about the land use versus the land access. And if you would be specific about um, Pyramid Lake, that would really be appreciated. Sure, so right now, because of everything that's been happening, um, of course, our, our tribe about a month ago shut you know, closed off the, the lake to non-tribal members for recreational use. And for people who aren't familiar with Pyramid Lake, Pyramid Lake is a huge uh, world-class fishery. Uh, people from all over the world come to fish here. And then of course, uh, this time of year, as it gets warmer, people come out to recreate, bring out their boats, bring their families out. But of course our communities, are, you know, unfortunately the COVID-19 cases are starting to increase here. We have three main communities that are being affected. And yeah, I think what I've noticed um, for a while now is, you know, especially because I am a fisherwoman, um, when within the fishing industry out here, um, people who come to fish and recreate aren't aware of our history. Right, they come and they go fishing with guides who aren't from our reservation and who aren't community members. And so they're not learning about our people. They're not learning about our, our history at all. And so when they come out here, they don't even connect our people with the lake. They just come out here to fish and to recreate. And so that's, that's a big issue. Um, and it's become apparent after the lake closure, how many people feel that they're entitled to our lake. Um, you know, really negative comments uh, directed at our tribe and at our people for that lake closure. And yeah, they just feel that they're so entitled to this area and they feel that it's their land too, which isn't the case. And these are, of course, uh, non-tribal members who are expressing these concerns. Um, and yeah, that's been really disappointing, but also people need to respect that we have sovereignty over our land and we have to do everything that we can to protect our people and to protect our communities, especially our elders and our youth. Um, all of our people are valuable and, you know, we carry so much knowledge and we have to protect our community members. And so, yeah, as of today, actually, our tribe set up uh, checkpoints. On the reservation and so there were still a lot of people who were not reading you know they were saying that they didn't see the signs um, or that they didn't know about the lake closure which there's huge signs that are posted when you drive into the reservation so um, yeah because there were still a lot of people coming out we actually had to impose uh, checkpoints and so that's another safety measure that we're taking to protect our community and I'm really glad that we're doing that so the whole issue of land access and you know um, the way that we govern our land it has definitely become a, a big topic as of lately uh, with the pandemic and yeah I'm, I'm glad you asked that but you know right now our, our tribe is doing the best that we can to protect our people and that does involve having to assert our sovereignty and our rights over our land Well, I want to thank you all for this um, really enlightening and educational conversation. Um, you bring to light such important issues about um, the history of land um, in this nation, in this country, and um, the, the fight for sovereignty of that land today. And I, I'm, I'm super grateful um, and, and commend you on the work that you do um, from an activistic standpoint uh, to a community standpoint and and, and as journalists. So thank you so much. I, I, a special thank you to Stacey Montooth for moderating this conversation and Autumn Harry, Sanavi Spoonhunter and Jarrett Work. Thank you so much for being a part of this Nevada Humanities uh, virtual salon. Um, I hope um, there's a ton of questions uh, rolling through Facebook right now. And uh, if we haven't gotten to the answers yet, uh, we'll get to them now. Uh, but thank you all for joining us and thank you for, for being a part of this conversation. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks.